All right, so um, if you haven't already done so, go ahead and check your audio. And um, if you do have any audio trouble today, I am putting the call-in number here into the chat again. So if you need to call in instead of using your headset or your computer speakers, um, please feel free to go ahead and do that. All right, so welcome to another IGNIS webinar. This is uh, the second webinar of the 2017 IGNIS season. And again, we're always thrilled to have you join us. And IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's what we're hoping to do today, uh, ex excite you, ignite your curiosity, and spark your intellect. And this series is brought to you by the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells, and Mark Carbon. And we'll be sharing our contact information with you later at the end of the webinar. So um, we'll get to that in a little bit. Our presenter today is Allison Green. And um, our topic today is how to become a more culturally responsive campus. And I'm really excited to have Allison join us and have her share all of her knowledge and expertise with us this, this afternoon. So thank you, Allison, for joining us. And thank you. Yeah. And um, if you'll note that our webinars um, are all captioned this season, and um, we've been doing that. I think this is our second year captioning. So a big shout out to um, a la carte for their real-time captioning services. And you can view those captions by clicking on the CC button in the top right corner of the um, audio video panel up there at the top right there. And um, you can also use Control or Command F8 to open and Control or Command W to close that captioning window if you, um, you know, want to enable it or get rid of it. You'll also find a list of Collaborate keyboard shortcuts that are located in the Help menu there at the top left of the screen. So um, you can find them there or you can um, access them online. and. Um, there's some images to help you find those shortcuts. And let me just snag um, a link for you here so that we can put that into the chat. Okay, there's a link to the shortcuts. Oh, this is a copy. Hold on. I'm still getting used to my new computer and having trouble doing a few things. I have a control or my function key and my control key are not in the same spots they used to be. So let me see if I can get this right this time. There we go. Okay, there are our keyboard shortcuts. And I'm also going to give you the accessibility guide for participants. I'm putting that into the chat now uh, just in case you need that. Okay, so moving on. As a reminder, these webinars are recorded, and you can access, access those recording links on the ATL blog. And let me grab you that link as well. That right into the chat for you. Okay, so uh, you can find the full um, schedule, and it is a complete schedule. Now I've got the last um, three dates that we just added, so there's six for the season. They're all in there now. And then traditionally, we start off by running through a few of the Collaborate tools. So we're going to do that real quick right now, and then I will uh, turn this over to Mark to introduce Allison. And we're really only going to be using chat and polling today, so I'm not going to linger too long on any of these. But here's our meeting interface. And you can see uh, the upper left panel is um, the audio video window. In the middle left is where you can see the participants that are logged in. And the bottom left is the chat window. Please feel free to put comments, questions, resources, whatever you'd like to share into the chat as we are moving through this presentation. The the whiteboard space is where you're seeing the slides now. And then I don't think we're going to be using the toolbar today, so we won't really talk about that. I do want to talk about the polling tool. Ellison has a few polls planned for us um, about two-thirds of the way through um, her content. So um, be prepared to do that. And um, if you'll look in the participants panel in the image um, on the whiteboard, it's where the little check mark is. 
but um, on the panel today, it's actually where the alphabetical letter A is. We've just changed it from a yes, no question to A, B, C, D, because that's how Allison's questions are phrased. So if you'd like to take just one second and go over to the participant panel and find that and just practice clicking in one. I just did a B so that you could see what it looked like. So if anybody wants to practice, feel free to go ahead and do that because we will be using this tool later on. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and clear that out. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Mark now to introduce Allison. Well, thank you, Alyssa. So yes, I get the pleasure of introducing Allison Green to you today. Allison's been teaching and writing uh, teaching writing at Highline College um, through an equity and justice lens for over 20 years now. Uh, in 1996, Allison co-founded the first LGBT student club at Highline College. And then again in 1999, she helped establish the diversity globalism requirement, which has now become Highline's diversity and globalism studies department. So that's, uh, that's pretty impressive right there. Currently, Allison co-facilitates a quarterly discussion group on anti-racism for white faculty and staff and in collaboration with many of her colleagues. Allison has uh, developed a Canvas-based resource for professional development and culturally responsiveness called Culturally Responsive Cab um, Campus. And I hope you tell us today if it's available in Commons or not. Um, so Allison is also a professional writer. She has two published books, uh, the first being a novel, Half Moon Scar, and the second, a memoir, The Ghosts Who Travel With Me. So welcome, uh, Allison, and uh, we're going to get started and listen to this great presentation you have for us today. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Alyssa, and Bonnie, and everyone there, and thank you for inviting me. Um, how is everybody today? Can you give me a little hello or something so I know you're there? <laughs> oh, I'm doing great, but I've already talked a lot, so. <laughs> but I can't see a smiley face. Yeah, there's emoticons also up in that participant panel if you want to, and in the chat, too. So feel free to give Allison some love here. Great. So I've never done a webinar before, so this is uh, interesting to see you all virtually out there. So thank you. I see your smiley faces. So the reason I'm here today is to talk about a project we've been working on at Highline called Culturally Responsive Campus. Uh, Culturally Responsive Campus. And um, we've developed a Canvas-based set of modules for professional development for faculty and staff around uh, cultural responsiveness. And um, you know, it's, been, it's been a process of three to five to six years, depending on where you begin. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're defining cultural responsiveness, tell you a little bit of history of the project, um, tell you what the project entails in the modules, and then suggest some tips for if you wanted to organize a project like this on your campus. So before uh, we get started, I wanted to ask you to do a little word association and what words come to mind when you think of cultural responsiveness or cultural competence? Go ahead and type those into the chat. Or raise University. your hand and we can call on you. Inclusiveness, equity, mm -hmm. pluralism, tolerance, mm -hmm. equity. Yeah, definitely. So the word cultural competence is the older phrase, I believe. And um, you know, I kind of use them interchangeably at this point. There was a point at some point where people started to say, well, you can never really be fully competent in another culture, but you can be culturally responsive to other cultures. So I, I just think of them as somewhat interchangeable, and it's not um, super important to me which one we're using, but we as a campus are using cultural responsiveness. So I see more posts here feeling like part of the campus, yet belonging. 
having that awareness of how other cultures impact, definitely. Yeah. So cultural competence, the scholarship uh, largely has come from these fields. Uh, healthcare, early childhood, K through 12 education, social and human services, going pretty far back, uh, definitely 70s and 80s. But of course, all knowledge is building on previous knowledge. Um, so um, again, it's sort of hard to say where it all begins. Um, in higher education, there has been a fair amount of scholarship within disciplines. So for example, my discipline of English has aspects of a scholarship on teaching diverse students, for sure. Um, but in terms of scholarship on higher education in general, I would just say in cultural responsiveness, it's not been as, uh, there hasn't been as much as in healthcare and early childhood and K through 12 education and social and human services. But someone I like to, uh, that I, whose work I find very helpful is Geneva Gay who's a professor of education at the University of Washington. So her focus is on secondary education. But this is a definition, she says, that um, the education of racially, ethnically, and culturally diverse students should connect in-school learning to out-of-school living, promote educational equity and excellence, create community among individuals from different cultural, social, and ethnic backgrounds, and develop students' agency, efficacy, and empowerment. So these are definitely four key pillars uh, of what we see as important for um, thinking about cultural responsiveness. So this connecting what you're doing in school with out of school, focusing on equity, a lot of you said equity, uh, developing community, and helping students uh, have agency in the educational process. So uh, here at Highline, our education department uses this definition. Uh, cultural responsiveness is the will and skill to create authentic and effective relationships. And this is a picture of our instructor, Patricia McDonald, who was, uh, we were giving a workshop in the fall in our professional development day on cultural responsiveness. And you can see the connections between what this definition has in it and what Geneva Gay's definition have in it that it's, you can't really know how what you're doing in school or in the classroom or in an advising relationship uh, for the student outside of school if you don't have a, an authentic and effective relationship. And that relationship also helps us to build community. It also helps us to develop student agency. So that's the definition that our education department uses. We have also this sort of broader definition in our modules that the cultural responsiveness is the ability to deliver services, teach, advise, make policy decisions, and manage people and processes by taking into account cultural differences and issues of equity. So we're trying to focus on how every single thing we do as educators, whether we're teachers, whether we're working with a student across the front desk, or whether we're in a business office, or whether we're an administrator, that it's, it all has, um, uh, can connect to cultural responsiveness. And I should say here, too, that by cultural, we mean in the broadest of definitions here. And we specifically focus on uh, social identities or group identities, so race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, socioeconomic status, religion, uh, immigration status, sort of all those big groups. Uh, identities that we have. So we're, we're looking at cultural responsiveness very, very broadly. Um, any questions about definitions? You are more than welcome to ask questions as they go along. Yep, thanks for reminding the audience of that. Uh, Allison, I totally forgot to mention that. So yeah, please do type questions into the chat, raise your hand, um, ask questions as we go, and um, Allison will field those. Um, within her presentation time. Yeah. Okay, so that's how we're defining things. Um, this is what the modules look like, and I recognize that you really can't read this at all, and um, I'll explain out a while uh, sort of why we're not actually sharing the modules with other institutions. Um, but I just wanted to give you a feel for what it looks like in Canvas. Um, so it's nonlinear, organized in a nonlinear way so that people can kind of dive in 
wherever and however they want to to make their own personal professional development plan or if they're working with a group or a department, they can do that as well. So obviously each of these is a link. There are uh, four sections, uh, a getting started section, a know yourself, a know your students and community section, and a know your um, practice section, which I'll explain in a minute. And then there's a section with just key, key concepts and terms. So that's what it looks like. Um, and so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of how we got here. So as you know, I've been working on diversity and equity issues for a long time at Highline, over 20 years. And as time went on, I came to feel that there were a couple of challenges that were getting in the way of our moving forward sort of um, in a deeper way with cultural responsiveness and as a campus. And at this point, I was really thinking of faculty I really wasn't thinking of staff at that point. We added staff in later. At this point, I was chair of the Arts and Humanities Division, um, and I organized a task force. Uh, and we, a group of us that we just, whoever, myself and other folks sort of identified as experts, you can see some of the areas, just got together to talk about, well, what does it mean to be culturally responsive, uh, a culturally responsive educator? And the only staff member was the director of multicultural services, who was Yoshiko Harden at that time. So we got together, and um, we came up with our framework. So the education faculty, again, um, were influential here in drawing our attention to Gary Howard's book, We Can't Teach teach what we don't know, white teachers, multiracial schools. And um, he argues that you should know yourself, know your students, and know your practice. So know yourself uh, means a number of things, but it includes things like understanding uh, your social identities and whether they privileged or marginalized you. So let's, um, let's move to the first um, poll, and I'll come back to students and practice. So here's one question on our rubric around our framework for cultural responsiveness. How confident are you that you can articulate your social identities, e.g. race, gender, socioeconomic position, sexual identity, religion, et cetera, uh, disability, and how they have privileged and or marginalized you? So I don't want to make anybody do anything they don't want to do, but if you would like to uh, put up there your A, B, C, or D, we could sort of see where people are feeling they are with uh, this rubric item. So go ahead and use the polling tool to answer the question. I see some of you have put your answers in the chat, which is fine. Those just won't show up in um, the poll. Uh, but those are in the chat we can see. So let's see. Uh, we'll give you just a minute or two to answer that, and then we'll publish those to the whiteboard. All right, Allison, there are your responses. Here we go. So, so this, uh, the idea here is not to uh, quiz you or test you, and in fact, we don't have any quizzes or exams in the modules, um, but it's part of a rubric to help people kind of self-identify. Where are they? What are the things they already feel like they know? What are the things they would like to know more about. So the other items on the rubric under Know Yourself are um, about analyze your attitudes and assumptions about students, education, and uh, your college, and how they impact your work. So for example, what assumptions are you making about the students you work with? What assumptions are you making about education, the educational system that are impacting your work? Um, and then a third idea in our Know Yourself framework is um, knowing your institution. So by knowing yourself, it's not just knowing yourself individually, but knowing your institution. What is your institution's mission and culture? Hi, Mark Lentini from my Highline, who just joined us. Mark was very much a part of this uh, project, too. So Mark, you're welcome to join in and uh, add your comments. So that's the Know Yourself part of the rubric. And um, the second part of the framework and the rubric is knowing your students. So here's a question on our rubric. 
How confident are you that you can describe what your students' interests are and what skills they bring to your college? So feel free to self uh, score yourself there. Um, now, we did eventually drop, broaden this out to staff. And so uh, th what, how this might look, depending on your job, it might be if you're uh, meeting a student across the front desk. It might mean that what questions do you ask the student so that you know that you're giving them a useful answer, uh, as opposed to making assumptions about what that student needs or what they know or what kind of education they already have. And of course, if you're a teacher, it raises questions about how do you know what your students' interests are? How do you know what skills they bring to your classroom? How can you build on those? And you can see how this connects with Geneva Gay's definition uh, that Schools should um, connect, we should connect in-school learning to out-of-school living. So if we don't know our students, it's pretty hard to do that. All right, so seeing people self-evaluate there. So for knowing your students, um, some other things on our rubric are investigating your institution's demographics and learning as much as possible about where your students live and are from. Uh, so this is uh, also about knowing who your school is serving, and I always find that I have some information about all those communities, but there's always more to learn. Theorizing how students' social identities have affected them and their educations. Um, those are the other items on our rubric, Know Your Students. All right, so then the third item on our framework is Know Your Practice, and by practice we mean Anything you do for your job, whether it could be running a meeting, it could be um, allocating resources for something, it could be teaching, of course, uh, it could be advising students. So here's one question from our rubric on how well do you know your practice. So how, well, how confident are you that you can explain to students how to navigate college operations, advocate for themselves, and critically analyze a higher education system. So feel free to rate yourself there. Okay. Yeah. So again, you know, it's no right or wrong answer. It's about evaluating where you are and what more you would like to know. And that can then help you using our Canvas modules to, um, to move forward in your learning. This is what we know about culturally responsive education is that there is always more to learn, that it's a lifelong journey, and we're always uh, and learning more. So it's um, wherever you are is where you are. So to um, back up now and explain then um, we got, we got this framework developed, and for a couple of years we did workshops on campus. And um, we discovered, uh, we started developing um, a sort of a, an, an understanding that um, while people's heart is in the right place, um, we didn't have a systematic approach for them to work on their professional development. So with uh, Joy Smoker, who is now retired, and Mark Mantini and I, um, talked about putting some modules in Canvas. And this was after Mark had organized a very successful uh, program to help faculty learn how to use Canvas when we switched from Angel to Canvas. Um, and so uh, now if you're a faculty member and you want to use Canvas, you need to do this orientation set of modules. and. Uh, Joy had this idea that let's, what about cultural responsiveness professional development? Could we work that into modules? So she applied for a state board faculty and staff learning community grant, and um, we began to develop the modules. So in 2014, in the fall, we got together a whole bunch of faculty and staff um, at a retreat for a day and just brainstormed what would we like to see in these modules. And we began to develop the modules, and this is our outcomes we developed probably late winter quarter. So our outcomes for the project were to develop a shared understanding of vocabulary and key concepts. So 
this is the know your practice, right? How it relates to cultural responsiveness. Articulate our individual and departmental roles in addressing um, diversity and equity. So that's a know yourself aspect. And then explore present and historical influences on ourselves, our students, our colleagues, and our community. So that is a know yourself and a know your students uh, part of the, the uh, project. So those are our outcomes. And then so back to what the actual modules look like. And um, let me tell you sort of what they look like and then how we're using them. So as I said before, we have these sort of four sections. We have a getting started, we have a know yourself section, a know your students and communities, and a know your practice section. And what we did is we divided um, people into groups, teams, that each took on a module. And so um, one group did would have worked on this module, for example. But every module was organized in the same way. There were preview questions. Then there were like readings or videos or other things you could learn from, application activities, and then some additional resources. So, um, for example, this one, it has a preview question of, think about your own experiences in school or college. To what extent did you feel like an outsider? And to what extent did, was that based on a social identity, like race or gender or class or disability? Uh, to what extent did you not feel like an outsider? What did staff and faculty do that made you feel like an insider? So our suggestion for both faculty and staff in doing their own professional development work would be to write down their answers to these questions. Um, and think of that as where they begin. And then we have a number of readings. Um, they include a reading uh, co-authored by Highline instructor Daryl Bryce called Relationships Precede Learning, Reflections on Being, and Teaching Students of Color. Um, also, some, a summary of ideas from a book called Teaching Men of Color in the Community College, a guidebook. Uh, so people do some reading, and then the activities are, of course, so which of these things are you already doing? Which would you like to do? What would you like to do differently? Um, write down a plan for yourself. Uh, give yourself a few weeks or months to enact it, and then come back and reflect. So we're doing qualitative narrative assessment. So that's how all the modules work. And then how we're using these on a campus is in a number of ways. So um, a couple of years ago, cultural responsiveness was added to our tenure criteria. So faculty going through tenure can use these modules with their tenure working committees as they're writing their own self-assessments. Uh, they're, they're, I think they do two self-assessments a year. If you're in the post-tenure process, every five years, you're using the same criteria. So again, you could be writing this up as part of your narrative or in the merit uh, raised proposal process. Uh, for staff, it could be that you work on it with your supervisor. Um, you could also, though, organize your department or, uh, or, or a small group of people to get together. And then those of us who have worked on the modules have offered ourselves as facilitators of our areas of expertise. So if a few people wanted to get together and work through a module together, they could, and we could, one or two of us could come facilitate. And in fact, uh, Laura Manning, who has our Leech, uh, Learning and Teaching Center, and I have given a couple of workshops this year to staff groups on microaggressions and, uh, and um, social identity. So in fact, that's what's happening. So um, that's my explanation of the modules themselves. Before I move on to sort of suggestions for a project like this, are there questions about the modules themselves right now? Go ahead and type your questions into the chat or feel free to raise your hand and use your mic. We'll call on you and you can ask your question verbally. Or are you going to think about it for the end? <laughs> Possibly. Doesn't look like we have anything in the chat right now, Allison. So okay. You might be good to go. Okay. So tips for developing a project like this on your campus. So Mark had um, brought up earlier, you know, is, are our modules in the digital comments? And the answer is no. And the reason for this is um, we had a lot of conversations about our digital artifact. Just if any of you have done a faculty staff.
Pottery Committee for the State Board, you know that at the end of the project, they would like a digital artifact. So they would like something that um, can be shared with other institutions, and um, which I think is very important, right, to disseminate all this good work people are doing. But after a while, we came to the conclusion that uh, it was very important for institutions to organically develop their own project. That it was the work of defining your framework or your outcomes together and coming to a shared understanding of what those are and getting the experts on your campus to share their expertise and work with, in teams that would actually get all of this information disseminated. So in the end, what we decided was that our digital artifact would be something like this webinar, um, which is a set of suggestions for developing a project like this on your campus. So um, I really recommend, and this is just from also my years of, of working, getting projects started, is that you gather a smallish group to begin with. You certainly could go bigger at the beginning and have some a big kind of summit and have people brainstorm ideas. You certainly could. But I think really drawing on those folks who have really uh, substantial knowledge of the topic, that they're the people that are always giving the workshops or always coming to the workshops, and get together and just ask yourself, uh, what would it mean to be culturally responsive at your institution as a teacher, as a staff member, as an administrator? Um, what would that look like? And um, begin to brainstorm. Now, because I was really focused on faculty, we started with faculty, and we added staff in later, and that has continued to be a challenge. Um, my co-leader the first year on the, on the grant was Natasha Burroughs, who was uh, uh, Director of Multicultural Affairs, and so she gave a really good staff side um, perspective that was very helpful. And then the second year, Allison Lau, who's the Associate Dean for Counseling, was the, my co-leader, and uh, they gave really crucial information. Um, but I think had we started with staff, it would have uh, been less like wedging in staff issues later. So that would be one thing I would suggest. So then from there, work toward a framework. What would your framework look like? Uh, the rubric questions that I showed you actually derived from an original table in which we had um, sort of each thing that we would consider something a culturally responsive educator would do, and then some examples of what that would look like, and then some resources. That's how we started. And then we boiled it down into a rubric. And somebody posted earlier, those may be three different things, the working, helping students uh, be agents, and they certainly are three different things. And like all outcomes creation, sometimes we have collapsed um, many ideas into one, and it's a little, uh, you, you, we really could have 50 outcomes, but uh, we're just, of course, you try to be um, as simple as possible by at the same time recognizing the complexity of the issue. So while you're working on this process, uh, especially developing the framework, I think is, of course, getting as much feedback from stakeholders as you can. So these are some of the ways we got feedback from stakeholders throughout the process. Um, we did focus groups. Uh, we called them listening sessions. And the ones with the students I thought were particularly valuable. Uh, we asked them, what have a, has a staff member or an instructor done that made you feel that you belonged? Um, what has a staff member or faculty member done that made you feel that you didn't belong? And then we were able to use some of their comments in the modules themselves, which I think is very um, powerful. Um, as we developed the framework, then we kind of went out in ripples, like circle, circular ripples, where we would have one-on-one um, -on -one discussions and interviews with other campus experts and share the framework and say, what's missing? What would, what would you add? What would you change? Um, how would you, might you word this differently? So that the framework evolved over a couple of years. And then we've done a lot of mini workshops at meetings. Um, we've, uh, we have our quarterly faculty meetings, and so we've often taken a, um, uh, a little piece of a module, for example, and presented it at a meeting, and we've had index cards on the table so that people could 
um, write down your questions, what more do you want to know, uh, what's your response to, to this. So um, getting feedback is, is obviously very important throughout the process. Um, and then once you're ready to build modules would be to delegate the, the modules to teams. And so what we did with some of our grant money was to pay for lunch quarterly, and uh, people would do show and tell. And uh, of course, some of the modules were quite complicated, and some were simpler. So some people got done before other people, and then they could share what they had done, and we could kind of brainstorm ideas. Um, and what I liked is a lot of these teams were mixed faculty and staff teams, which I thought was really great. And you know, we over 30 people became involved. And it's kind of cool because we're now starting to see as we've rolled out the modules that people are coming to us and saying, hey, we have expertise in this particular area. Can we write a module? So like the psychology department came to us and said, uh, we'd like to do a module on implicit bias and the research on implicit bias, which we have a little bit about implicit bias in the modules, but of course, that's what the psychology people know all about. So that's been cool. And people looked at the modules and said, hey, what about this uh, kind of module. And so it's an ongoing product project and um, you really have to be willing to come back and revise and build or it won't be that effective. Then perhaps one of the hardest parts is institutionalizing the project. Um, who will continue to maintain and update the modules, coordinate workshops, publicize them, work with faculty and staff, etc. If, if it just sits there by itself, um, it was nobody kind of guiding the project. Um, and no sort of built-in, it's part of someone's job or uh, to do, I think these kinds of things can really wither. And we've all seen projects wither, and uh, so we don't want to do that. So I want to tell you um, some of the ways we're institutionalizing the project at Highline this year. Um, so I have five credits, of course, released per quarter to be cultural responsiveness coordinator. I have very strong feelings that this is not something any one person should do for more than a couple of years. Again, I think the more people are invested in it and involved in it, the better. Um, so this does mean that um, we need to start thinking about who would take over this work next year or the year after that. And, um, and of course, I would still continue to work on the project, but to, to get that ripple effect out into the community. We're also doing cultural responsiveness conversations. Uh, we're doing two per quarter. And um, what that is, is I ask the lead writers on a module to facilitate a conversation. They don't have to prepare anything or present anything, and I will send out the module to the campus and um, ahead of time and say, hey, it would be great if you read the module first, and then we get folks together for a conversation. And those have been very well attended. We've had 25 to 30 people at each of those. We are offering workshops and presentations for departments, as I said earlier. Uh, we've done a couple of workshops with departments. Um, we're also seeing some departments using them on their own, uh, so that's been great. And then we're offering individual meetings with faculty and staff, so I've had Faculty and staff say, hey, um, could you have coffee with me? And we sat down and talked about what are their challenges and how they might use the, the modules. And then, of course, workshops during our professional development day. And then the other thing that I'm working on is I think it's very helpful for faculty to, well, actually, in fact, one of the things on our rubric is to know the uh, multicultural scholarship in your discipline or area. And so uh, I've pulled together so far one for the English department. I wanted to start with my own discipline, of course. Um, and then we, and then I'm going to, I'm beginning to work with departments to put together kind of bibliographies for their own disciplines. Uh, so those are how we're institutionally institutionalizing it at Highline. Um, so Mark, do you want to pipe up with anything from your point of view from the project? You were very, very involved have been very involved. Are you still here? Mark may not still be here. I think you really, I think you really covered the landscape, Allison. Um, I, yeah, I definitely agree. Having somebody with the time dedicated to their, to leading this, and, and really, I, I think of it um, 
along the lines of building a community and, and maybe some of the literature online about community management, um, which is, which is kind of hip in the software world right now. Um, you really do need that lead person. And, and then she needs to be someone who, who is taking the time to build the relationships on campus, which is largely what you've been doing, you know, over the course of the entire project. And I should say that Mark has had a kind of a dual role. He's been uh, one of our experts on Canvas and using the Canvas modules, and so we could have done it without that expertise. Um, and then, um, and then Mark was involved in developing the module for um, working with colleagues, which is one of our larger, more complicated modules. So. Hello. I'm here until three. You know, Allison, I'll, I'll just add, um, I think as we were working on it those last probably three, four months, you really um, you really got in and got hands-on with helping us write and, and helping us write our way out of some jams that we got ourselves into. So, um, you know, in, in terms of the skills that the facilitator brings, that was, that was really valuable. Yeah, so some groups asked me to join them to work on, on their module with them. And I think the two things that I bring, I think one is, of course, um, my curriculum development knowledge. And then I think it really helps that I'm a writer, that that's what, that that's what I do uh, professionally. Um, but I think um, everybody brings, <laughs> this is approving, um, I think everybody brings their, their expertise to the conversation. I would not argue that I'm an expert on cultural responsiveness at all. There are, when I rate myself on the rubric, there are areas I really need to work on. So I don't think that that's necessarily the primary need for a facilitator, uh, but I think someone who can kind of help people move forward um, and, 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 and write the modules. So that's actually all I have prepared. I, there's lots of time for questions. I'd be curious to know what concerns or questions people have or issues that they're noticing at their institutions. So go ahead and put your questions and comments into the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you. Okay. Um, Allison, do you want to read this one yourself, or you want me to read it to you? The modules we have at Highline are so useful for self-reflection. Is that the one you're looking at? Yep. Uh huh. But also when considering themes for writing classes. Oh, good idea. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Uh, great way to put action to these ideas and make them real. Yeah, I think you know. Uh, it's, I think it's hard to articulate exactly what does cultural responsiveness look like. And that was just our timer. Yeah. <laughs> but you've still got plenty of time left, so no worries. Yeah. So are the modules going to be available to the public? Yeah. So, again, they're not, um, at least our, our concern at this point is that it really, really helps if you um, develop them in-house. But, you know, of course, if anybody wanted to, you know, come and take a tour of the modules, be happy to share them, um, and, and, and really kind of sharing the whole set of modules, I'd want to go back to the whole group again, because that was a decision we made as a group, um, and not, that wasn't a decision I personally made, it was a decision everybody made, so I'd want to go back to the group about making the modules themselves available. Um, but certainly, if anybody wanted to, um, I, I could give you a little tour of the modules. Which classes have used some of the modules and learned how they've been used? Um, you know, we're going to do, a, I want to do a survey at the end of the, this year and find out how people are using the modules. Um, but that's a good point that we could um, share that information about who's using them and how they've used them. Um, and again, you know, our primary audience was not students, but I can totally see how that would be valuable too. And in fact, this is the first time I've ever thought of, oh, you could use these in a class. It's, uh, 
Yeah, so interested in reviewing them as available to the public. Again, um, they're not available um, just generally to the public, but um, I can think about how would there be a way for people to take a tour. Um, maybe you have an idea, Mark. Um, can people be added to the modules for a week or a day and then they could kind of roam around? I don't know if, it, if it's possible to add them from outside the system. But the comments, that's a possibility. Yeah, I, you know, I'd have to think about that with as far as how our um, how our authentication works. Um, let me chew on that one for a bit. Yeah. Um, the the off the top of my head, uh, you know, a session something like this where we do a screen share and, and you walk up, right? You walk through the modules with um, people looking in on it uh, might would be an easy way to get at least some look at it. It wouldn't be super in depth, but but at least people could see how we structured it and um, and what the content looks like. You know, I could, I was actually just a little too afraid to do this with the technology, but I, I do have my modules open, and I think, Alyssa, if you help me, I think I can um, make that available just for a clearer view. Sure. So you got, I need to go up to this little globe, right? But it's not the globe, it's the one in the middle with the overlapping rectangles, and mm -hmm. then you just pick which application you want to share. So if you want to share just your browser that you've got your modules open in, then you can um, tour us through parts of your class. Okay. All right, are you seeing that? We are. See, it's a good thing we practiced, huh? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> you're, you're doing fantastic. Great. Yeah, I was just a little afraid that I wouldn't ever get back to wherever I was supposed to be um, if I did this. So we'll see if I can get back. Uh, but so yeah, so if you can see more clearly, so here's our getting started. There's our definitions, um, our outcomes, and a list of contributors. Here's the rubric, right? And it has um, more information there. And then suggestions for how people might organize um, their learning. Um, how can I better understand my own social identities? So for those of you that have, are we, you know, that you know this kind of material. Um, the addressing model, we're using the addressing model, so having people um, think about their social identities, identify them, their identities, and self-reflect. So that's our know yourself social identities. Um, uh, Highlights, mission and culture. Um, so this is reading through our uh, various statements that relate to diversity and equity. Um, our student demographics, and then thinking about how you might think about the demographics of your own department or your area, um, talking to faculty and staff about Highline and our culture here. So that's knowing yourself. Um, and then you can see these are uh, the knowing your students and communities. So under communities we have, there have been a number of demographic reports about our communities. Um, and so you can read about our African American community, our Latinx community, our Asian American Pacific Islander communities, our uh, American Indian Alaska Native communities. Um, and thinking about uh, suggesting that people go to community events in our service area, uh, taking a driving tour in the service area. Yeah, so how many modules and what are their titles? So yeah, so we think of each of these as a module, each of these links. Um, so how many are there? Here under students, we have the community one. We have multilingual students, students of color, veterans, students with disabilities, first generation college students, students of non-traditional ages, students in gender, and students in sexual identity. And obviously that doesn't cover every group. Uh, but that's how far we are so far. And then knowing your practice, we have focused around uh, how does my job support Highline schools? Um, how can I teach, provide services, manage and administer, um, and be, work with my colleagues in a culturally responsive way? So I think this is where we have our fabulous tree. Is this where our tree is? There's our tree. Uh, this was made by two students in our um, graphic design, not called graphic design, but the, the students in that program. 
um, thinking about how you are part of a larger community and what your role is. Um, one fun activity we had is uh, go, we all, we, for everyone that is hired in Highland, you would have written a diversity statement when you were hired. Go back and ask HR for your diversity statement from when you were hired. Reread it and ask, what would you change if you were writing it now? One of our fun activities there. Um, the teaching one has several modules in it. Uh, providing services, we're still kind of working on that one. Uh, and Natasha Burroughs did a great one on managing and administrating and talks about hiring, management, budgeting, and resource allocation, really focused on equity. And this is the one Mark worked on, being more culturally responsive with colleagues. Here's our key terms. And you can see here are a couple sections we know are, are kind of in the hopper. So that gives you a better sense of that. Um, I'm not sure how I get back now here. Allison, you can either just um, do stop sharing, or I can just click us back to the whiteboard. Click us back. That would be great. There we go. Yay, yeah, thank you. That was something I learned in practicing with you, is that I didn't have to make you stop sharing in order to go back to the whiteboard. So even I learned something in our practice session. Oh, excellent. excellent. Yeah. So I, think, right. I, I don't know. I think you can maybe see that um, one of the challenges is that if we just sort of make this all available, um, will people kind of come at it from where their own level of expertise and really kind of share that and shape it and develop it in a way that's useful for you institutionally? That's the, that's the question. Looks like Mark might be typing something else into the chat. Um, any other questions from anyone? I agree, Allison. It is a challenge to to put that out there. I mean, because the process is part of the learning, but also experiencing someone else's process can help you get started. True. I think one of, one of my questions would be: is I don't even think I would know where to start. I mean, even with the tips that you gave, I don't. If I was just a faculty member or a staff um, member somewhere, I don't know if I would even know who to go talk to. I mean, so we, you have that whole other assembling block yeah. of you know people exist that might be interested in this, but how do you get connected with those people in the first place? Because not every campus might have somebody who is um, a vocal expert. I mean, there, I'm sure there are mm -hmm. experts on every campus, but you know, maybe, maybe they're not well known enough to other people. So I guess that'd be my own personal um, question would be, how do you even get connected with people if you're interested in finding out more about this kind of work on your campus? Right. Well, and I agree. So, you know, trying to figure out who those folks are. And, and, but I think once you find a, one or two, they'll, they'll know who the others are. So if you have a director of multicultural affairs or if you have a learning and teaching center, um, those would be some places to start for sure. Yeah, great um, suggestions. Yeah. All right. Well, we are down to about eight minutes left. And uh, if we don't have... Any other questions or comments, I'll go ahead and um, close us out. Um, Earl made a comment. He says that this looks like a very usable structure for uh, broader and deeper engagement. So I think you're getting lots of compliments in the, the chat area. Uh, great work. Thank you for doing this work, Alma says. We really need it. And Kathleen said great work. So um, I agree. I think you've done. Um, you know, an exceptional job here, and I think you put it into a framework for um, participants to understand and internalize, you know, your your project and um, maybe think more about how it might apply to them and their work and their students and their campus. Uh, yeah. Tony, Tony says that she was um, inspired and that they're just getting digging into this at North, so yeah. Yeah, and then I see a question about the diversity statement. Um, so here at Highline, for many years, when you applied for a job, there was usually a question around diversity and equity that you had to answer to apply. And our HR department has saved those. I have been a little anxious about looking back at mine from 1994. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we uh, they apparently have it. So 
it, we thought it would be an interesting activity if faculty and staff asked HR for the, what they themselves had written when they were hired and to review it now and say, how much more have I learned since then? So we thought that was a good activity for thinking about your role uh, with diversity and equity in your campus. I would like to say, you know, for those of you like Tony that are getting started, I would be more than happy to um, just come up and say hi and, and talk to anybody that was interested. Um, I think what we haven't sort of talked a lot about is the connections between colleges, right? That, that how do we work? How do we do something that works organically for our institution but also make connections with other institutions? Is it all right if I um, put your email address into the chat, Allison? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And you're agreen at highline.edu, is that correct? That's right. All right. So there you go all. There's Allison's email for you. Okay. All right. Um, here's her bio bibliography. And I did um, paste those into the chat at when she started talking about um, these particular books, so those were in there, uh, but you can also snag them from her slides. I'll be putting her slides on the ATL website with our webinar recording. And then um, we actually have back-to-back -back, uh, webinars for IGNIS um, this month. So we have April 6th today, and then uh, next Thursday on April 13th, we're going to be joined by Sally Halstead from the Lake Washington Institute of Technology. She's the Associate Dean of Instruction there. And she's going to uh, talk to us about the four connections for student and faculty success. So I hope you'll all uh, join us for that one as well. Uh, feel free to invite all your friends and colleagues, anyone um, who may be interested. These webinars are open to everyone, and our room can accommodate a very large uh, number of people. So don't be shy about um, inviting others to join us for um, these, these events. Here is contact information for myself and Mark. We are um, both in the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. So um, feel free to contact us if you need more information on IGNIS or have other questions. And um, we do thank you for joining us today. And all of our work is licensed under a Creative Commons uh, license. So please feel free to reuse and distribute any of our IGNIS materials if they are helpful to you. So thanks again for joining us. And we are wrapping up just a couple minutes early today. Um, it's sunny where I am. Maybe you're having some sun, too. So uh, maybe you can uh, go out and enjoy some nice weather now. And again, thank you, Allison, so much for joining us. It was great to have you, a pleasure, and um, I think your topic is very relevant and um, very interesting. Uh, Mark, do you have any closing comments before we go? Mark Carbon? Uh, no, I don't. Just uh, thank you again to Allison and everyone for uh, showing up and participating. Yeah, and thank, thank you. you. Thanks to Mark Lentini also for um, joining us. That was a nice little um, guest surprise. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yep, thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and end our recording now.